In this part of the video, we will talk about pulmonary function testing, which measure flow and volume. Pulmonary function tests accurately diagnose ventilatory disorders of the lung, such as obstructive and restrictive diseases. In order to understand how the floor and volume changes in obstructive versus restrictive disease, Let's first take a look at lung structure and normal floor and volume in a lung system. Right here, I will draw the cross section of the lung. And here we have one AOA. You know that there are a lot of them, but let me draw here one for explanation purposes. The AOAs are attached to the lung tissue. Therefore, during expiration, they tend to keep them open and prevent them from collapsing. This is how the normal lung works. Restrictive lung disease includes acute respiratory distress syndrome and interstitial lung diseases such as sarcoidosis and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Let's see what happens with the lung given in our example of one most classic form of restrictive diseases of the lung, fibrosis. In pulmonary fibrosis, the main problem is in a parenchyma of the lung. The problem is that it becomes fibrotic, meaning the elastic fibers increase in amount. When this happens, elastic recoil of the lung increases, and this keeps the lung deflated. As a consequence, all lung volumes decrease. In addition, increased recoil force decreases compliance, making the lung difficult to expand during inspiration. For this reason, patients with restrictive pulmonary disease mainly have trouble with inspiration, not expiration. To sum it up, in restrictive lung disease, we have increased recoil force, decreased compliance, and decreased FRC again because of the recoil force that deflates the lung. The situation is inverse in obstructive disease, which includes chronic bronchitis, asthma, and emphysema. Let's see what happens with the lung given an example of one most classic form of obstructive diseases of the lung, emphysema. In pulmonary emphysema, we are losing the elastic tissue of the lung parenchyma and alveolar septa. This airway is no longer tethered to the lung tissue. As the result of the losing elastic tissue, the recoil decreases, whereas compliance increases. It would be very easy to stretch and expand the lung. Thus, such patients do not experience trouble with inspiration. In addition, losing the elastic tissue means that these areas are no longer tethered to the tissue. Because of this, being no longer tethered to the lung tissue, they constrict and narrow due to smooth muscle constriction. Thus, these areas have a tendency to collapse during expiration. It is very important to note that when a patient with emphysema expires, during expiration, the compressive force on the outside of the lung not only compresses the alveoli to push air out, but also it compresses the bronchioles, increasing their resistance because they are no longer attached to the lung tissue, which tended to hold them open. It is very important to note that increased airway resistance during expiration leads to two main problems. First, when the bronchioles collapse during expiration, resistance in this airway is increased. Thus, the alveoli cannot completely push air out, and therefore, of course, patients mainly have problems with expiration, not inspiration. So, again, increasing resistance first causes expiratory difficulties. And second, when the bronchioles collapse during expiration, the alveoli cannot completely push air out, and therefore excessive air remains in alveoli, 
and this air trapping increases the alveolar size. As a consequence, over many years, this leads to increasing FRC. To sum it up, in a case of obstructive lung diseases, the recoil decreases, bears compliance increases. In addition, FRC increases. There are two reasons of increasing FRC. First, when the bronchioles collapse during expiration, the alveoli cannot completely push air out and therefore excessive air remains in the alveoli and increase their size. As a consequence, over many years, over the years, this leads to increasing FRC. Second, because of increasing lung compliance. Again, compliance is inverse to recoil. When the recoil is decreased, the chest wall springs outwards and pulls the lung expanded because of this increased compliance. This now will increase the FRC. The purpose of talking about all of this was to apply this information to pulmonary function tests. One of the most useful clinical pulmonary tests that is also simple is to make a record on a spirometer of the forced vital capacity. In y-axis we have the lung volume and in x-axis time. One square is equal to one second. Suppose a person breathes quietly in and out. In performing the FVC maneuver, the person first inspires inspiratory capacity maximally to the total lung capacity. Then you ask him, hold your breath for a second and expire as quickly and forcefully as possible. When he does this, he will reach the residual volume. The total distance of the down slope of the lung volume record represents the FVC. It is very important to note that normally the most air in FVC maneuver is expired during the first second. The volume of air that can be expired in the first second of the FVC maneuver is called FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second. Another important parameter for our purposes is FEV1 FVC ratio. These are the main important data values to determine the volume and floor during first second of FVC. As you see, the FEV1 is 4 liters, whereas the FVC, the total amount of air expired, is 5 liters. FEV1 then will be normally 80% or 0.8. Now, let's see how these parameters change in the case of obstructive pulmonary disease. It is very important to know that in obstructive pulmonary disease, especially in emphysema, the lung loses elastic tissue. This decreases the recoil force of the lung, which in turn increases compliance. The lung will be easily stretched. As a consequence, the recoil force of the chest wall pulls the lung outward and the lung volume increases at FRC. Total lung capacity is normal or larger than normal. Maybe it will be 7 liters instead of 6 liters. The FRC also increases and suppose it is 5 liters instead of 4. And the residual volume will be 3 liters, suppose. The lung will operate in large volumes. Suppose the patient is quietly breathing the tidal volume in spirometer, but it is happening in increased FRC because of the inflated lung. When you ask him to inspire maximally to the total lung capacity, he can reach 7 liters instead of normal total lung capacity, which should be 6 liters. Then you ask him, hold your breath for a second and expire as quickly and forcefully as possible. When he does this, 
he will reach the residual volume. If you have noted, the residual volume is also increased. During a maximal force expiration from total line capacity, a smaller than normal volume is slowly expired. The FVC is decreased and now it is 4 liters. The FEV1 is also decreased and now it is 2 liters. If you calculate the FEV1 FVC ratio, 2 divided by 4 will be 50% or 0.5. This is less than normal. It is extremely important to note that in this case both FEV1 and FVC are reduced but the FEV1 is reduced more than FVC. Because we are decreasing numerator more than denominator, the fraction decreases. Thus, FEV1 FVC ratio is decreased. To sum it up, in obstructive lung diseases, the lung compliance increases. The total lung capacity is normal or increased. FRC and residual volume increase. FEV1 and FVC decrease, but FEV1 decreases more than FVC. FEV1 FVC ratio decreases, it is 50%. Now let's see how these parameters change in the case of restrictive pulmonary disease. It is very important to know that in restrictive pulmonary disease, especially in fibrosis, the lung is fibrotic. This increases the recoil force, which in turn decreases the compliance of the lung. As a consequence, the recoil deflates the lung and decreases all volumes. Maybe the total lung capacity will be 4 liters instead of 6 liters. The FRC will be 3 liters instead of 4 and the residual volume will be, let's suppose, 0.5 liter. Please remember that the lung will operate in small volumes. Suppose the patient is quietly breathing the tidal volume in spirometer, but it is happening in a decreased FRC because of the deflated lung. When you ask him to inspire maximally to the total lung capacity, he can reach only 4 liters instead of normal total lung capacity, which should be 6 liters. This is because of increased recoil force. The lung is very stiff and compliance is decreased. It is difficult to overcome the recoil and expand the lung. Then you ask him, hold the breath for a second and expire as quickly and forcefully as possible. When he does this, he will reach the residual volume. If you have noted, the residual volume is also decreased. The FVC is decreased, now it is 3.5 liter. The FEV1 is also decreased and now it is 3 liters. If you calculate the FEV1 FVC ratio, 3 divided by 3.5 will be 88%. This is more than normal. It is extremely important to note that in this case both FEV1 and FVC are reduced, but the FVC is reduced more than FEV1. Because we are decreasing denominator more than numerator, the fraction increases. Thus FEV1 FVC ratio is increased. I hope it makes sense. To sum it up, in restrictive lung disease, the lung compliance decreases. The total lung capacity, FRC, and residual volume decrease. It is extremely important to note that in this case, both FEV1 and FVC are reduced, but the FVC is reduced more than FEV1. FEV1 FVC ratio is normal or increased. It is 88% in this case. Now let's talk about the floor volume loop. The instantaneous relationship between floor and lung volume during a maximal expiration from total lung capacity is useful in determining whether obstructive or restrictive lung disease is present. 
first let's see the normal floor volume loop. On the upper part we have the expiration and in the lower inspiration. And y-axis is floor in liters per second. And x-axis is long volume. This point is residual volume and this is total lung capacity. The volume increases from right to left. You ask a person to breathe in as deep as he can and you reach the total lung capacity. Then you ask him to blow out as hard and as fast as he can. The flow is very high in the beginning of expiration and therefore we will reach this point. This point is called peak expiratory flow. At this point a very important event occurs. When we reach the peak expiratory flow, at this point a partial collapse of the large AOEs occurs. This increases AOE resistance and limits the maximum flow rate. Once the partial collapse has occurred, airflow becomes effort independent. This means no matter how hard you try to expire the air, you cannot increase the flow because the large AOEs are partially collapsed. This makes the test very reproducible. The partial collapse is called dynamic compression of the AOEs. When you reach the peak expiratory flow, the floor begins dramatically falling and you reach the residual volume. This volume from here to here is FVC. Actually, the inspiration loop is not very important for the USMLE because they cannot ask anything about it. But anyways, this is how the person inspires to the total lung capacity. And here is the peak inspiratory flow. Let's see how the loop changes in case of obstructive pulmonary disease. On one axis we have the lung volume and on another we have the expiratory flow rate. First, I will draw the normal loop with the dashed lines. It is very important to know that in an obstructive pulmonary disease, the lung volume increases. This means that the loop will shift from the right to the left, all volumes increase. Suppose here will be the residual volume, close to 3 liters. The total lung capacity will be normal or increased. It also increases to the left side. Suppose it is close to 6 liters. Thus, in obstructive disease, the flow volume loop begins and ends at abnormally high lung volumes. When you ask a person to blow as hard and as fast as he can from the total lung capacity, you will reach this point. You will reach the peak expiratory flow, which is decreased. Then the volume continues dramatically falling, meaning floor decreases and you will reach the residual volume. In addition, the downslope of expiration scallops or bows inward. This scalloping indicates that at any given lung volume, flow is less. Thus, AOA resistance is elevated. I have mentioned about the mechanism and hope you remember it. Now, let's see how the loop changes in case of restrictive pulmonary disease. It is very important to know that in restrictive pulmonary disease, the lung volumes decrease. This means that loop shifts from left to the right. All volumes decrease. Suppose here will be the residual volume at 0.5 liter. The total lung capacity will be decreased. It also decreases to the right side. Maybe it will be here close to 3 liters. Thus, in restrictive disease, the flow volume loop begins and ends at abnormally low lung volumes. When you ask a person to blow as hard and as fast as he can from the total lung capacity, you will reach this point. You will reach the peak expiratory flow, which is decreased.
Then the volume again continues dramatically falling, meaning floor decreases, and you will reach the residual volume. Again, this would be obstructive pulmonary diseases loop, which is shifted to the left because the lung is working at an abnormally large volume. And this is how the restrictive pulmonary disease loop looks like. In this case, the loop is shifted to the right because the lung is working at an abnormally small volume. 